I tell my entrepreneurs that it's got to be somebody like try, you know, give it a shot. And so showing up is like half the battle, I think, or more than half the battle. You know, there's just some certain things to live by, both in the good times and the bad. You know, don't let your companies get too much money too quickly. Don't have them be overvalued. Let them, you know, grow at a certain sort of robust pace, but have the, have a really good foundation underneath them. Make sure you are in a very early stage, you know, bring on great board members that are independent, you know, independent people that mm -hmm. can can help them and can mm -hmm. help them from an operational perspective, an introductory perspective. And and just, you know, don't have too many boards. A red flag for me is when they're not talking to the consumer or they're just super stubborn in how they see their market and their product. That, that's not really how things are built. Welcome to the Smart Venture Podcast. We're here to bring you the latest and greatest from the Silicon Valley, where unicorns roam and innovation never sleeps. We've got top investors, superstar founders, and well-known tech executives lined up to share their secrets on building and investing in successful companies. Just a quick disclaimer, while we may sound like financial geniuses, but please don't mistake us for your friendly neighborhood financial advisors. So let's get started and dive into the wild world of tech entrepreneurship. I, to start the show, I will give the audience a little bit of background of yours. So you grew up in a small town where you're a first generation college student who worked their way through college and in high school, you, your physics professor told you that engineering is a better path than being an artist and which lead you to study engineering. And then after school, you work at PNG and NextCard. Later on, you started your career in venture after you JD and MBA at Berkeley and become a super successful person in venture. Then you were on the Midas list. I just feel like I have so much respect <laughs> to you. And then we just chat about how many kids you have. I, I feel like I just really need to learn all your secret about time management. You mentioned you go to take the MBA and JD for a sabbatical. How do you pick the best company? And then how do you kind of like shape your career? Like give us a yeah. core lessons that you've kind of learned throughout your career that kind of like you feel like make you unique than like a lot of other people. So I was, I, I think I've always been an entrepreneur and really loved, even when I was at Procter & Gamble, I got to, I was tapped to do international markets. So new markets, new products, you know, around the world. And it required a lot of, you know, entrepreneurial thinking about how to just get things done in a foreign country. And we, we it was good to have the backing of P&G, but it took some pretty scrappy, scrappy kind of thinking from time to time, which was really mm -hmm. fun. And so, you know, what I always think of when I pick a company <clears throat> is, you know, what would I start right now if I weren't doing venture, right? That, that's mm -hmm. always my thought process. You know, what would I be, what would I start? What would I be the chief marketing officer, or chief revenue officer of if, if not doing this right now? Because there are many, there are many reasons why. One is, you know, I'm always looking macro, you know, what, what needs to be true, you know, given the current state of the world and what, what is that next exciting thing? You know, we get paid, you know, by our LPs to see around the corner and that's the most fun thing I could possibly think of. And so that's the lens that we, mm -hmm. that I look at things through. And then, you know, from it's, you know, the company is the idea, but then who do I want to work with for 10 years? And mm -hmm. I think you always have to have this 10 years, 10 year lens on it. So it was really interesting. My company case text just exited or the mm -hmm. not my company, but mm -hmm. one that I invested in. And I was talking to Jake, the CEO, and he was telling me how when he was in Y Combinator, they told him it was going to be a 10 year journey. Mm -hmm. And he thought, no way. There's just absolutely no way it's really 10 years. But you know what? If you build a good company, it's 10 years to exit. And and they happen to be on the very cutting edge of LLMs for a number mm -hmm. of years. You know, it's been as long as I've been invested, right? And because of that, they had access to GPT-4, I think this time last year. And you know, to date, still have the most robust implementation of GPT-4 that's really known. And we're sold for you know, 650 million in cash to Thomson Reuters. So that it, it takes a while. So when I'm looking at companies, it's it's what's the macro? You know, what's that? What mm -hmm. you know, what needs to happen? It needs to be true. Mm -hmm. And and then you know, who's the CEO and the team that you know I get to work with for the next you know 10 years is what you have to think about. I think I think just like SEOs, a lot of times people accomplish things because they don't know how hard it is. They don't they didn't know what the rules kind of were ahead of time, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think having grown up, you know, in Missouri, you know, in, mm -hmm. in a small town initially, and then in a bigger town of Springfield later, where actually Brad Pitt went to high school, believe it or not, mm -hmm. like my claim to fame. So anyway, so having grown up in that situation where, you know, I was, you know, a first gen college kid and 
I just didn't know how that things were hard, right? Mm -hmm. And that, you know, things, you know, and I I thought I was going out to Harvard and Stanford when I got out of, you know, college, mm -hmm. high school. And my parents were like, no, you're going to go where we can drive because we can't fly to take you places, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was a state school kid or a state school kid my whole way through of the University of Missouri and then UC Berkeley. And so I did, you know, chemical engineering because it had the most optionality for me. And, and I worked at a nuclear research reactor when I was in, you know, when I was an undergrad, because I thought it was really fun, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. I was, I was enamored with like all the different research projects going on. So the University of Missouri actually has the highest powered uh, nuclear research reactor in the nation. And we had all kinds of cool stuff. We had the O-rings and the space crystals. And so I got paid to go, you know, not only do my own research, mm -hmm. but be able to visit all the labs and, and the nuclear reactor and talk mm -hmm. to all the professors there. So super fun. And so you just, you kind of just don't know what's unusual. Right. And then, you know, I worked at P and G and got the chance to, oh, this is a funny story. Do you want to hear a funny story? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was at Procter and Gamble, you know, I, I'd only been on a plane a couple of times. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was, I had got for the head of, head of the global category to launch brands in Mexico city and Mexico and Latam. And so the president of P and G at that time had said, Hey, if I am traveling to Mexico, you could get on the corporate jet and, and go too. So I literally thought I was saving the company money by no, making by sure I coordinated my schedule <laughs> to where I'm like, oh, well, you know, I don't want to, you know, instead of like charging a plane ticket at a separate time, it was the funniest thing. But, you know, now, but looking back, like spending that kind of time on those plane flights, you know, with the, the senior, senior, senior management at P&G was amazing. I mean, I learned so much and they would ask me questions about what was going on with young people and why we were doing certain things or not doing certain things. And it was just amazing mentorship, but I actually truly thought I was saving them money by taking the corporate jet back and forth when other people oh were my going. God. <laughs> um, yeah. Sorry. So I think, and, and I think the core lesson is just like, you know, my mom would always tell me, you know, when I would, when there would be scholarships or there'd be opportunities or there would be something like really, you know, out there that just seemed like too much of a reach. Mm -hmm. She'd say, well, they have to pick somebody. Why not you? And oh it, yeah. And so that just sticks in my head, you know, it's like, put your name in the freaking hat, right? Like, why not you? And then work for it because you just never know. And I do remember there was one time because I paid my own way through college, right? So I worked at the nuclear reactor I, I waited tables and the most hilarious job I ever had probably was teaching football players chemistry, <laughs> which is a whole, like probably another topic, but, but I applied for a scholarship one time and it was like some really prestigious scholarship and like no one else applied for it. And so I got oh it and then I was so excited <laughs> and, then, and I was so excited I, and I, it was great. And then somebody broke the news like nobody else applied. <laughs> But yeah, I spent I hours on the application. I spent so long, you know? So, I mean, I still tell my kids that to this day, like, go for it, right? And and, and I tell my entrepreneurs that it's got to be somebody, like, try, you know, give it a shot. And so showing up is like half the battle, I think, or more than half the battle. Oh my God. I This is so encouraging. So I always feel like looking at your journey, I feel like you just have like this not afraid mindset that like, you know, <laughs> I feel like, you For have example, to know I, enough to be afraid, right? I think that's the problem. <laughs> I um, I just have so much respect for you. Like when, okay, so I got a couple <laughs> questions there. So sure, I think course. number one is like, you know, you're not afraid of like showing up. Like, you know, you're shooting for these, like, you know, like a lot of things that people are like thinking maybe they don't deserve or like something like that. I, I really love that mindset. And then the other thing is what I thought you were like really being really humble about is like you mentioned, like, for example, you met like Gary Little. I know that like you met him in like a pizza line in Berkeley. And I wonder <laughs> like, OK, so this is such an undersell because I feel like you must be really, really good that like someone would be like, OK, why don't you work with me, right? So like I wonder, like, how do you like after you landed these opportunities that are like super, you know, rare, how do you kind of like impress people or like stay? in the orbit of like really smart people's zone to like kind of like keeping in touch with them what are things that you would do to kind of like make set yourself apart from like a, a bunch of other people yeah I think when I think what serves me well is that I I can't help but 
tell if people ask me what I think, mm-hmm. um, they get a straight answer, right? And I, and I'll tell you that that's what, that's what happened at Procter and Gamble. You know, and I was there was a bunch of stuff going on at the time, and the head of the category, global category just wanted to know what the hell was going on, right? And mm-hmm. and I couldn't help, but I mean, it's like that Midwestern gene in me, I think, right? Mm-hmm. And so I think people appreciate two things. I think they appreciate the candor, right? Mm-hmm. And and I've learned through my life to ask people a couple times when they ask me, what, well, what do you think? Mm-hmm. And I've learned to say, well, do you really want to know? <laughs> mm-hmm. And then I learned to sometimes ask a second time, like, do, do you absolutely really want to know what I think? And I, and I will not, I mean, if they, they are like, maybe not, I'm like, okay, that's good. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? But then the other thing too, is that when I make a commitment, I'm like right there with them. And so what I, so yes, I'm going to flag the problem, but then mm-hmm. I'm going to, I will turn around immediately become part of the solution. And so, mm-hmm. you know, with, with, you know, our CEOs and our boards, it's like, okay, yes, here's the problem, but you know, we're all in the same boat. I'm not the boss. I'm on the board. I I, I have a part in this too. And mm-hmm. again, it's that Midwestern ethos of like, how can I do my part? Right. Mm-hmm. And so I don't just sort of point out the problem. I always have been, I've been taught in my life to come with a solution, right? You Mm -hmm. you do no one any good to say, oh, there's, there's an issue. If you're going to point out the issue, you know, think of how Mm -hmm. you would at least suggest fixing it. So you can start Mm -hmm. that conversation, right? Mm -hmm. I think, I think it's those two things. And so usually, you know, people that want an investor just to write a check and go away. I am very clear. I'm like, I'm mm-hmm. not your person, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know? And, and there are those people and I'm like, well, there's a lot of money out there. There's a lot of other people you can get money from. But if you want like a partner and you want somebody who's ex- as excited about your business as you are, and you want somebody who's going to be constantly thinking about how to grow it and who to hire and what to do and like what the opportunities are, like I'm, I'm your person. And so, so that's, I think that's what helps a lot. Mm. Totally. What do you identify as like one skill that will help you succeed in venture? Because like you mentioned, like, you know, venture rewards, the ADD part of you. Like, oh, yeah. No, not, like, like ADD, particular- you must have ADD. I, ne- I never thought I'd ever find a career where my massive ADD, like doing like 50 million things at one time. I think the one skill that is uh, non-negotiable in venture and you must have is networking. Mm-hmm. Like this just sheer, like, sheer desire to put people together and put mm-hmm. ideas together. I've been told if I wasn't doing, you know, wasn't an investor and, and wasn't in venture, I would be a recruiter. I'd be a mm-hmm. matchmaker mm-hmm. because it's just, it's just constantly, that's even how I got into venture. You know, as I had taken my sabbatical and I was at, at the, I was doing a JD MBA and I had, I had a baby actually when I was in school too, I had my oldest and I just, you know, saw all these opportunities. And so I would go into the law school and I would pull the the law school students into the business school to help the business school students, you know, get basically free legal work because, you know, mm-hmm. not to pay for it because some of the firms had worked out this deal where they got options and all this crazy stuff. I'm like, why are you doing that? Like, we can just get it for free, go to the like law school and then get the pro bono lawyers, you know, for these <laughs> big firms to like help you that way. And then, and then I would go to the engineering school. And so I ran the business plan competition and I would go in and and try and just sort of sit in the labs and hang out with people and and figure out what they were doing. And then I would just connect people. And that that's how that's how it all kind of worked. Although in the engineering school, the last thing you ever want to say is that you're from the business school. Mm-hmm. So they would ask me, you know, what I what I did. And I would just throw in that I was, you know, an engineer too. And I worked at a nuclear reactor and then I could stay. But if you led with the I'm from the business school, you just you were you were you were doomed. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. And then I learned too that, you know, once I started working in the venture firm and I was I was an intern, I would I just bring food. And so mm-hmm. that again, Midwestern roots, right? Feed people. And so I would make sure to bring the amazing food and I could get anyone to come to these events if I brought the right food. <laughs> oh my God. Um like cheese board would... pizza at Berkeley was particularly effective. That was oh. very yeah, that worked. Thank you for sharing that. That's uh, such a secret feed for people. like you know, feed people. Anyone will come out of the lab. <laughs> the people walk around and knock on the door like there's cheese board pizza and sushi. Like they'll come. <laughs> I love that. That's such a life hack. Um, like feed people. I'm, I, I've gotten so much done in my life just by bringing people food. Really? Because as okay. they're eating your food, they have to talk to you. <laughs> what a secret. I just, I love that. I absolutely love that. Um, <laughs> so you joined this bond after Berkeley and I wonder, uh, and then later on, you know, you guys created Canvas Venture mm-hmm. and what were something that you think 
you wanted to do differently when you created your own fund compared to like what everybody else is doing in the venture yeah. ecosystem. And then back in time, it was also like a recession. What would you say mm-hmm. are things that are equivalent to what we need to do today? I and, and the, our firm really has taken an approach of you know operating consistently and steadily. So we didn't go and raise a massive, huge fund and you know, stack on board seats and do things like that. We've just remained very, very consistent and steady and had really great exits, you know, when it's hot and and now. And so I think what I learned and, and a lot of this is just having really great people to learn from. So Gary Little, you know, pulled me into venture, you know, way back in the day. And and he'd seen, you know, several cycles before that. And what you learn is venture is highly cyclical. And that typically every seven to 10 years, we're in this complete boom time right now and the longest you know, track record ever of it being like up and to the right, but every seven to 10 ish years, you know, venture capital is dead. It goes to this massive, you know, kind of, you know, thinning out period. And you'll see the press release prior the press headlines will say it's a cottage industry. It shouldn't exist and so on and so forth. Right. And it happens, you know, like clockwork pretty much, or it used to at least. And so, you know, what, you know, there's just some certain things to live by, both in the good times and the bad, you know, don't let your companies get too much money too quickly. Don't have them be overvalued. Let them, you know, grow at a certain sort of robust pace, but have the, have a really good foundation underneath them. Make sure you are in a very early stage, you know, bring on great board members that are independent, you know, independent people that mm-hmm. can, can help them and can mm-hmm. help them from an operational perspective and introductory perspective. And and just, you know, don't have too many boards. I mean, there there is a certain capacity that, you, you know, that you can't operate beyond and you just lose all effectiveness, right? So mm-hmm. for me, it's about 10-ish boards. If I'm on more than that, it, you know, I it, we just, so again, that steady pace and, and you have to sort of sell a company or exit a company, right, to pick mm-hmm. up a new board. And so, so that's, you know, what I had observed worked historically when I came into venture, I came in about the time Lehman crashed in 08. So there was mm-hmm. a lot to see. And right before that, there had been the same cycle of, you know, you know, good firms, you know, that were, you know, 400, $500 million, you know, funds that went up to a billion eight, a billion six, you know, two something. And guess what happened? Their next fund was back down to, you know, 400, 500 million, right? And so, you know, but really great. I, there were some really good role models out there. Great funds that were sort of in this mid-size of four or five hundred million dollar funds, and I thought that that makes a lot more sense to me. And, and just this ethos of, you know, focus on what you're good at. Don't get caught in the hype cycles. And if you notice, and it's hard to not get caught in the hype cycles because your LPs are like, "Why aren't you in crypto? And what happened to your blockchain portfolio?" Mm-hmm. And you're like, "It makes no sense, right?" But then all these really smart people are doing these deals, and you really have, I think that's part of what in my DNA helps me a lot is that I'm kind of used to having all, you know, other views, or I'm used to seeing the world a little differently than everyone else in Silicon Valley. Cause I mean, I can, I can go sit on a tractor when I go back home mm-hmm. in the Midwest, right? It's a very <laughs> different thing. And so I, I, you have to get really okay for a long time, maybe being wrong, but just sort of it, it just trusting your gut internally, like, God, you know, play, you know, play, this makes no sense. Like blockchain, like, hey, you're going to tell me it's more expensive and slower and not secure. And by the way, not anonymous. And that's somehow advantageous to me. I don't understand it. Right. And and then, you know, if you, a few things happen that look like you know, it's going the other direction, you're like, God, maybe I did miss out on something. So still having that sort of humility to be like, maybe I did totally miss it. Right. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, and then not having too much schadenfreude when you're, when you're right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, and, and things too. I mean, even when it comes down to like fiduciary, I, I don't, I, I, a year ago, you know, I talked to the times and I thought I got myself in trouble because I said, I just don't know how you could possibly give a, a venture capitalist money and have them not sit on a board. I just don't know how that works because what you're paying that person to do is be a fiduciary, right? And to watch over your investment. And so how you're giving a firm millions of dollars to invest on your behalf and they're not even taking a role in the company, I I don't get that, right? And Mm -hmm. now we see FTX, right? And so I was again told, oh yeah, that's actually more efficient and you know, it's more about picking. Well, I don't believe it's about picking at all. I think, yes, you want to, you know, invest in something that has good bones, like when you buy a house or real estate, 
But the next, you know, one to 10 years is all about the work the board does to help hire the right team, you know, focus the strategy, take advantage of new technology op opportunities, you know, the, the whole thing. And so it, it, I don't, I don't think it's about picking. I mean, picking is like a tiny part of the battle. So like you mentioned the company at the beginning. So like before they were sold, like basically you also like recruited like a CMO from like a legal firm for the company you invested in. And then like basically you recruited board member before you made the investment to the YC company. So I wonder how- Oh yeah, the case text. Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wonder why would you invest yourself into a company that you haven't invested in? And then like, was that like kind of a test to see like how far this coming can go, build the relationship or like how, how do yeah. you view that as like a part of, you know? Oh yeah. I mean, it's just what we do. And so, you know, you have a funnel and so it's not like mm -hmm. you go from like first date to marriage. Right. Yeah. So you think of it like that only mm -hmm. like in this case, you have like 10 marriages, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, you know, you, you meet a company and you like their idea and you think, gosh, you know, I really like the founder that, and let's just take case mm -hmm. text in point. Let's just take that mm -hmm. as an example because it's very analogous. There's so few companies that I've invested in where I mean I, I don't even I'm trying to think of one that I, I met the founder and then wrote them a check in a week. It just doesn't that's just not how I think it works. And so so it, it it's gotta be it's gotta be sort of this mutual relationship. And so it, even Doximity, I mean I knew Jeff Tagney. I mean it's mm -hmm. like a billion dollar return, right? So I knew Jeff Tagney and but I turned down the seed that he did. And then I turned down the A because at the A, it was really a doctor dating app, which is another mm -hmm. whole story. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then I kept, you know, in touch and I liked him and I liked where he was fishing and I liked how, what he was building. And then, you know, finally I ran into, into him across the street and, you know, before the series B and he says, Hey, you know, we've been thinking about this and that, and, and we, this is working. And like the suggestion that you have, like, we like this part, but not this part. And then all the th things were falling into place. And so my question was like, what's it going to cost me now? Right. Cause it would have been cheaper to do it earlier, but you know, who knows how it was going to turn out. And with case text, it was a little bit similar. I mean, I had met the team at case text at the A, I think, and series A, and I had just gotten out of law school and I just, I was amazed by the fact that this massive legal research industry even existed on case law, which was public document free public you know, documents, right? Mm. And there was this multi-billion dollar industry and the search was so bad that you literally had to structure your query like dog within three sentences of cats in the same paragraph as California. And it was that bad. And I thought this just can't be. And 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 there has to be a, any way to do this, especially with you know machine learning and AI. And we had we'd recently done Siri. And and other companies in that vein, and I just thought this this we were doing it. There was a lot of NLP work happening, and so I thought this this has to be better. And I met Jake though, but their initial idea was to crowdsource the law, which mm -hmm. crowdsourcing was kind of hot. And I I was like, God, how's that going to work? You know? And so will people pay for it? So I kept in touch, and then I was actually on a vacation, and I met <laughs> I met at the resort. I met this guy, Yaron who there, our kids were playing and he had happened to be, this is again, the networking thing, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, had happened to be the head chief revenue officer at a company that had sold ironically to Thomson Reuters for hundreds of millions of dollars. And very few people know how to sell things in, in the legal space, right? There'd been mm -hmm. not a lot of exits. And so I was like, you know what? There's this company that I just met with, you know, and I hadn't talked to Jake in a while, and I, so I came back and I, I, I might've actually just done it there. And I just introduced this guy, your own to Jake. And then he joined their board because, mm -hmm. it, and then he, he kind of kept track of the company for me. Right. And so I mm -hmm. said, well, I'm going to like, leave you all to it. Let me know how I can be helpful. And then, you know, they, that like, was actually helpful. So that yeah. was actually helpful. I, I loved like whenever <laughs> every investor say, let me know how can, how, how can I be helpful? And then you DM them and then it's gone. But anyway, oh, no, no, I, I actually try to do something helpful <laughs> I, because people's time is valuable. So if people are going to spend time with me, hopefully there's something of value, right? That mm. they get for that. Yeah, that happens, right? They just DM you and then they're just, they just evaporate. But yeah, interesting how that works. But, but anyway, so yeah, after, and then after, what happened is I would get, I would hear from them occasionally. And then one day I got this note from your own and it said, Hey, by the way, they have like three or five paying clients, one of which I happened to work for before. 
Mm-hmm. And so I called the head of the law firm and I'm like, what do you think about this company? And he said, great things. And then I thought, well, people will pay for it. And so that's when we came in. But it still mm-hmm. was not up and to the right, I will tell you. It wasn't like mm-hmm. that solved their problem and that was that. But at least there was like a product market fit. You could kind of a little bit judge. So there's two things that you said. Number one is you kind of introduced them some, someone that in the industry and then this person kind of like kept in touch with you. So you kind of like mm-hmm. monitor how the company was going. And then the other part, it was like you kind of like exam, can they really get customer? You call it like your old firm, exam if people will pay for their product, right? So when, let's say, what would you do if you're investing in something like a little bit more earlier stage? I know you're focusing on A and B, but like, let's say if you're like writing an angel check or something without much of information, would you mm-hmm. even do it? Or like, do you feel like this is just like a numbers game? You just spread like spray and pray. And it's definitely not, the- a number- it's not a numbers game because if you have 10 deals, you just need one to work. And if you have a hundred deals, you just need one to work. Right. And mm-hmm. so to- can- and hundred can blow up, but you can invest in two. And I mean, no, it's not a numbers game. I mean, people who are good investors are consistent, right? It's totally mm-hmm. completely not a numbers game. And the reason I, I would be hard pressed to invest in something that was a random angel deal. And then I just wrote a check for it. the earliest I've ever gone in a company. It was really this company, Gabby, but mm-hmm. I had been after the co-founder for 10 years to join one of my <laughs> companies. So he, I had interviewed this guy when I was at practice fusion on the board and I really liked him. And then he kept in touch over the years and I would kept trying to find a place to put him because he was just such an exceptional marketer. And one day he, he emailed me and he's like, hey, I, we haven't talked in a long time, but they were working on an idea in Gabby, which was an insure tech company that I really liked. And I knew him and I got to know the CEO and, and that's really the earliest I've gone, but that was after 10 years of trying, you know, and that, that ended very well. I mean, so we came in in the A and then they raised a series B and then they sold to, to experience what 300, almost 400 million, I think. Yeah. So, so that was, that, that ended quite well, but that I, I wouldn't just, you don't just pray and pray. That's not how, I mean, companies are built, right? I mean, you don't, I mean, it's just the difference between taking like a packet of seeds and like throwing them all over the yard and hoping for the best or sitting down with an architect and, or, you know, and, and like planning the yard and picking the right trees and putting, I mean, mm-hmm. it's going to look very different when you're done. Right. Mm-hmm. And one's going to work and one's going to not. And so, so yeah, so I think I, I, we call it like inflection point investing, which kind of sounds mm-hmm. cheesy, but I guess we'll mm-hmm. go with that. And, and, and essentially it's what I, we learn at Procter & Gamble and that is like, look for product market fit. Right. And mm-hmm. there are a couple of key things in that, that I think a lot of people in the Valley forget. One is your opinion doesn't matter. So mm-hmm. wait, I, you know. I, and I, when this happened, you see so many companies that you're like, I call it like, you know, geeks or engineers or geeks gone wild, right? Where they, mm-hmm. it sounded like this great idea and everyone's going to get all the data and they're going to look at it a million different ways. And like, nobody does that, right? Mm-hmm. And consumers don't behave that way. And the, the number one premise with consumer, anything with a consumer and a business can be a consumer too, is don't make me think. Like, don't make mm-hmm. me make a choice. Don't make me think. And so when you're looking for product market fit, where I have a bright red flag is when somebody around the table starts talking about themselves or their wife or their kid. And I'm like, y'all aren't the target market, right? <laughs> and so, <laughs> but what, what does resonate is when they start showing me how the actual consumer who found the product is using it. And then when I can talk to the consumer, when I can talk to the person using that product and, and find out why. And oftentimes it's very different than even what the entrepreneur thought when they were first developing it. And then the signs that I, I look for are that the entrepreneur or the founder then started moving to the consumer, right? Mm -hmm. A red flag for me is when they're not talking to the consumer or they're just super stubborn in how they see their market and their product. That's not really how things are built, right? So when they start really getting curious about the consumer and, and really thinking like, well, why did that happen, right? Why did they do, like, what problem am I solving for them? And how can I make it better for them? And sometimes it's little things. I mean, mm-hmm. at Doximity, the fax machine was key early on, right? And they didn't fight against it. Yes, they could have designed a product that you know was you know was super technologically forward, and they ended up having the best, I would say, AI team in our portfolio next to Case Text. But early on, they they said, "Wow, the users on fax." 
and we need to get, we need to meet the user where they're at and where they're at is the fax machine. And, and that, that went very far in my book because he was paying attention to the end consumer. And mm -hmm. so I think that's why I spend so much time and, and that's why it's why, you know, it's worth it to spend the time with the CEO because we, you know, you can yeah, you sort of think it is funnel management. You talk mm -hmm. to a thousand companies, you get to a certain point with a hundred, maybe there are 10 that you spend a lot of time with and check in, you mm -hmm. know, on a weekly or monthly basis. And you might do one deal from that, mm -hmm. but you know, all it takes is you know, one great deal, right? How do you spend your time? Like if over a, the course of a year, <laughs> you're investing in one deal, you're helping these like 10, 20 companies. My son keeps me pretty well informed too. Like he about fell over when he saw GPT-4 for the first time. He told me it was like a Sunday morning and I was sitting there in like my bathrobe and I had a little cup, cup of coffee and it was really early because we were meeting the East Coast board members on the Sunday morning. And the CEO of Case Tech was so excited and over the moon about what they just built with GPT-4. And this was like January, right? And they had the product ready to go. And so he insisted on the Sunday morning board call. And I'm like, okay, fine. So probably like eight o'clock, 8.30 in the morning. And and they're going through the whole product demo. And my son, who was what, 13 at the time, walks by the end of the table and he just freezes in his tracks. And he looks at me and his eyes are like this big, right? And he, he's such a dork, right? And so he, <laughs> you know, he, he goes like this, like, you know, cut the volume. And so I, I muted it. And he's like that. He goes, they're talking about GPT-4. And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, nobody has GPT-4, no one. And I'm like, they do. He's like, no, they don't. He goes, it's impossible. He goes, it's not public. Nobody can get their hands on it. And I'm like, how do you know about GPT-4? And he's like, of course. And he told me the whole thing about what it could do. And I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. And then, and he's like, can I see? And this was like, you know, double top secret at the time. And I'm like, hold on a second. And so I, I asked, you know, the CEO, I said, do you mind if, if, if he sits in? And he's like, no, absolutely. And so my son sat and like watched this product demo with his mouth open. And like this kid codes and does all this stuff all day. And then I was like, okay, we might have something here. <laughs> oh my God. So your, <laughs> your son funny. does your due diligence. And then, yeah. And, and then I was like, okay. And then afterwards I'm like, you cannot tell your friends. You cannot tell your, cause Amy goes to school with all these people whose parents are from Google and stuff. Right. And I'm like, nobody, I'm like, you are sworn cone of silence, right. Mm -hmm. That you don't say a word. But I was literally like the coolest mom on earth for like a day. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Uh, it's One day maybe. I think, I think it's I the same son who mentioned like Uber is great. He's going to Uber everywhere. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. That was hilarious. I tried to send Klanik the video of that. Um, but when Uber was out, um, yeah, we had taken this crazy trip to San Francisco and I had this brainchild of an idea to like take Caltrain because the kids never ride trains and then go to Fisherman's Wharf and God, I mean, God knows why I thought this was a good idea, but then we get down there and the kids are exhausted and, you know, the wheels are falling off the bus. And I'm like, and this is Uber is pretty new. And I'm like, wait, 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 we're going to, and I, and I, and I, I picked my phone and I'm like, wait, we're going to call Uber. And I, I opened the app and I hit the button and my son was mesmerized. He's like, those are where the cars are, mom. And I'm like, uh-huh. And then I just <laughs> let him hold the phone and he's like watching. And then the car pulls up. And, it, and, it, and and I open the door. He's like, can I get in? I'm like, you can. And then he gets in the car and he's like looking at the driver and he's he's really confused that we're in the stranger's car, right? And you got to remember, this was like not anything. I don't think the kid had been in a taxi before. And then he fastens the seatbelt and we, we start going and he looks at me and he goes, mom, when I grow up, I'm going to make a lot of money and Uber is going to take me everywhere. <laughs> oh my God. And I was kicking myself because Travis had been in my office, like pitching and like taking over the CEO of Uber cab or whatever. And I'm like, that's not going to work. I think but then you knew you, you were just wrong on so many fronts. <laughs> oh, okay. So I have a couple <laughs> questions for you. For sure. So you invest in Luminar. How did you find out about the company? And then what made you decided to invest in it? Okay. That's a crazier story. So that, that I would say is an anomaly for me, but has been one of the most fun anomalies I've, I've ever had. So I found out about it. My my associate at the time was managing a hacker house up the road. Mm -hmm. And she comes to me a few times and she's like, hi, this one guy at the hacker house, you know, is trying to figure out how to raise money. Mm -hmm. He'd like some, some advice or whatever. And she's like, but I don't think it's anything you'd ever invest in. And so do you mind? And I said, of course, I'll talk to him. You know, so he comes in. And at the time, I think Austin was like 18, right? Mm -hmm. And he sits down. And he starts telling me how he is going to create the crashless car. 
Mm-hmm. And that that's his goal. And it was just super interesting. And and I and any talk with Austin, I mean, you can it's like three hours later and you're still like kicking things around. And it's mm-hmm. just super interesting because he always asks the questions. You know, he's he's there's no arrogance to him at all. He's just like, why is that? Like never you never, you never say an and I premise without, you know, being able to tell him why. And so I started getting really into it because again, I had done a lot of edge tech a long time ago. And he pretty much convinced me that, you know, Quantergy, which was the billion dollar company at the time, had to break the laws of physics to actually work mm-hmm. and that there was nothing behind it. But that his idea of, you know, recreation of the LIDAR stack was necessary for, mm-hmm. for autonomous work. And, and, and there were, and then, you know, he, we, we spent a lot of hours together and I, and I would tell him how he needed to raise money the traditional way. Like, this is what a series A looks like. And this is what a series B looks like. And Austin's like, why? And I didn't really have a good answer. Right. And he's like, well, I don't, why would you do it that way? And, and so then, you know, he had actually put quite a bit of his own money into it because as a kid, I think he, he didn't really go to high school or college. He had, you know, been, you know, been building supercomputers and worked at the Beckman Laser Institute and like and laser optical physics and things like that, you know, really young. And his parents had just created this whole other path for him. Mm -hmm. And I'm fascinated by it. I've spent a lot of time talking to his parents, just being like, how did you think about this? And what did you do? And, and he just, he was, he's just a person that, you know, that he always asks why, and he just really starts at ground zero and never takes, because I said, as as a reason, and I was, I just, I really bought into how he saw the world and, and what he had to do. And I remember, and so I was finally spent enough time with him. I'm like, I'm just, I'm going to have to give you money because otherwise I'm <laughs> spending all this time with you. And, and so I ended up doing, doing a note, which we really never do, but I think they raise like, they raise a couple, almost a couple hundred million on safe notes before they raise their first round of, mm-hmm. of price. Right. And so, and then they ended up going public, but but it was just so fascinating. And I remember specifically um, in one of those conversations before I put money on, I, I always ask the question, like, what is it you're going for? Right. Are you, because there are a few things that happen, you know, and that you want to understand, like you want to, I play poker as well. And so you always, you want to make sure you're all at the same table. Right. And, and oftentimes VCs just aren't at the same table as the entrepreneurs. And so you want to, you want to make sure you are. Mm-hmm. And if the entrepreneur is like, yeah, I'm going to create this company. I'm going to sell it for hundred million dollars. That's not what you want to do. Right. Because like, you're just, you're not playing the same game. And I, so I said, well, Austin, you know, what, what is this? What do you, what are you in it for? And he looks at me and he's like, well, I'm going to be the youngest self-made billionaire. And, and, and he did it. I mean, there was no arrogance at all. And I looked at him for a second and nothing cracked. And I realized he was as serious as a heart attack. And I said, you know what? If you're game, I'm game. <laughs> and, so, and he did it. I mean, he actually did it, right? I mean, he 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 made it happen. And so, but he did it because he never, ever took anything at face value. He always wanted to know why. And he made his life a lot harder many times because he sort of, you know, started, you know, backwards engineered everything. But but it was, it's so, I mean, my, my job is so fun because I get to be around those kind of people that just make you think about things a little differently. Right. And then mm-hmm. make you realize that, well, you know, this is how this works. And you're like, well, maybe it doesn't work that way. And maybe you don't have to go to the right high school and the right college and do this and that, you know, maybe you can do what you love and, and take a totally different path. And, and it makes it, I, that's, my job is super fun because of that. In general, like in San Francisco, there's a lot of like really smart people. And I wonder like, how do you separate the smart and the super smart or like just overall, like, okay, you like, let's say you have one meeting with this person who seems really smart, but like, um, does that just automatically make them like a great CEO or like great, like founder? Not at all. No. I mean, one thing is you just learn humility in this job, right? Everyone's super smart. Like, I mean, there's a certain bar and like everyone's crossed it. Right. And so you know, they're, they're all there. And, and so it's everything else that matters. So I look for people that have an edge. And when I say have an edge, like I like people with a chip on their shoulder, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're here to prove something. And, Mm -hmm. and there's a reason why, like, I can pretty much tell you the story of all of my CEOs. Right. And, and and sometimes it drives my partners a little crazy because they think I'm too chit chatty, but I'm trying to create a comfort level where they can share with me why they're doing this. And there's usually an underlying story, right? Or something to prove. 
And that's important because, I mean, these people could all go make a boatload of money going to work for an investment bank or, you know, check in at Google or, you know, whatever. And they're going to make a lot less for a long time. And the startup is really hard, right? So why are they going to stay in the saddle and get up every day and make hard decisions? And maybe we haven't seen that in the last 10 years, but I've, you know, the first, you know, my first inventor, I took, I had to sort of take over the board seats of many companies that, you know, other people had invested and then didn't make it. And th those were hard times where people had to like cut the burn, cut the people. And then the people that made those choices early, they, they did make it. So, so I think every, everyone's smart. So I think we just take that as a given, right? And I don't care if you went to Stanford or you went to a state school, right? Mm. They're all smart. And, and, and that's a whole nother aside, but I'll take the state school kid every day. <laughs> Especially University of Illinois. That's my personal favorite. Oh, thank um, you. I, I went to U of I. You did? Oh my yeah, gosh. I went to U of I. You should have oh started with that. Oh my gosh. Oh my I would, I, I, the, the, all you Why? had to do on your email was say, I went to University of Illinois and I'd be like, of course I'll talk to you. That oh might've been God. what happened. That might've been, yeah, because I'll tell you like all the stuff that Silicon Valley claim or Stanford claims credit for, it's all mm -hmm. University of Illinois. It's Andreessen and Levchin and, and Siebel and David Filo. I mean, you name it. Mm -hmm. It's University of Illinois. It's a hard school. And so it's the best end school in the country, in my opinion. But anyway, sorry. We should I agree. I okay, will good. start with this. <laughs> now you're my new favorite person. So, you've so already I been my new favorite. Like you're like literally on my, like, you know, I would <laughs> like my dream guest list for many years. I just like, oh God, anyway, okay, okay, please keep going. So, so, so everyone's smart. And, and so I think it's like, what get, what, what's the chip on the shoulder? And, and that maybe that doesn't sound as positive. It should sound, but what, what, what is it that like, what's the grit that that person's shown in life so that we know that when things get hard or, you know, or maybe that $200 million offer comes right. And they've just started out that they're going to be like, no, I'm going for it. Right. And then, you know, the key for me is I, how are they listening to their consumer? Like how, and I'll, I ask lots of questions, you know, how, how are they pivoting and making decisions? How are they making decisions? How are they changing their mindset? How are they changing their product? Right. To deliver um, a product that people are going to want to buy. And I, and I look for that. And then do they, and then the other thing, and sometimes this takes some time is, how, who do they surround themselves with? Right. Are they willing, you know, is their goal learning and, and, and building something really big? And the only way you get there is if you're willing to surround yourself with people better than you. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so you kind of, I look for that too. Like who have they brought in, right? Who have they, who have they, who have they relied on, you know, and who mm -hmm. have they taken counsel from? So those are a lot of things, but yeah, everyone's smart. I think, I mean, we run into so many smart people, like that's sort of a given, Right. Mm. Although not always, but, mm -hmm. <laughs> but we want to think that that's sometimes investors. I have big mm -hmm. questions. <laughs> I think, okay. So I have another question around like your personal develop development zone. Like okay. I feel like you are just like, I feel like, you know, you mentioned about like, you know, when it was state, st state school and then like yeah. you eventually went to Berkeley and like all that. So I wonder like, you know, you had like such a great, track record and then you like work at like png and then eventually you work in venture like just overall like not like literally i would say you're like better than 99 putting 99 percent of people in like venture like not <laughs> not also like you're a woman so like i wonder i want to know like what's your drive where does your drive come from and then number two is like how do you figure out like what to do in each step because like you know, I don't really know what I'm doing to be completely honest with you. Like, I wonder how do you figure out like the each step for your own life? No, you're so, I think you know what you're doing. You're super scrappy. We were talking about what you built. And now that I know you came from U of I, it all makes a lot more sense. So I, so I don't, 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 don't tell, sell yourself short by any stretch of the imagination. So for me, I think what happens with me is I just get super focused and I, and I get excited about new technology and, and, and it's just, it's even when I'm doing like sports or anything, I'm super, super accident prone. I mean, I just hurt myself again the other day mm -hmm. and it's because if I'm doing sports or I'm doing anything. I just get really focused and I cease paying attention. And so my kids think it's hilarious. I've been to the ER like more times than my entire family put together in just the time I've had the kids. <laughs> so so I, I think that's just it. And, and I, I just really am interested and curious and I have a lot of energy, which is good and bad sometimes. But I, I, I think I'm super lucky to have the job I have. I mean, I don't even really know how it happens sometimes, but 
but it's really fun. I mean, I, and I like to help people. I, I think that's just it. I, 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 I sometimes think, well, maybe I should, you know, start a company, but I realize that the role that I have is really well suited to me because I have such bad ADD, right? I, I just, I get, I'm like, oh yeah, that's interesting. And then, then just like this connection of the dots, right? It's like, you're putting this puzzle together kind of all the time, which is really fun. And then I do exceptionally well when the shit hits the fan. So that, that's mm-hmm. what's really fun. So my kids are like, mom, you can make like lemonade out of lemons all the time. And so like when COVID hit, I'm like, I found out very early because I was, I was helping with some numbers and stats and stuff. I was like, wow, this thing dies at 74 degrees. What island are we going to guys? And uh, <laughs> I had ourselves, I had us on Maui like in a matter of months, like in the, I rented a condo over there. So I just like, I don't, I just think everything is an opportunity and I actually really like change and I welcome that. And so I think that's rare. I think a lot of people, I think in venture, you have to be just comfortable in chaos. You have to be super comfortable when things are messy because all companies are so messy early on. Like there's a million things going wrong. Nothing's really ironed out yet. And you have to be really, really comfortable just in chaos and knowing, you know what, today I'm just going to fix one thing. And then directionally, we're going to get this better over time. Where I'm super uncomfortable is predictability and and when everything's the same. And other people like that. I know I know people that like everything like looking the same every day, right? And I think I'd be a nomad if I could be, right? I love traveling. Mm-hmm. I love seeing other cultures. I mean, I just, it's just, I love, you know, learning about other things. And so I think that serves me well in this particular role. I think it's caused problems for me in other jobs. <laughs> and so, uh, but, you know, I think when you find something that your personality type is a good fit for, you're really lucky. So mm. yeah. I, I feel like you're just like, like after you said all your hobbies, I just like have even more like I just like really love what you have done. Oh, like almost like every part of like your journey sounds like a really just like ideal situation to be in, in general. But like, I, I no, it, well, it may it may not have felt like that at the time. I will tell you. <laughs> if you're starting out today with like a new fund, if Canvas Ventures is starting today, what would you do differently compared to what you did back then? What would I do differently? I think I would double down even more on the network of people and mm-hmm. really, and, and I, it's part of the plan we had initially done, but maybe didn't execute on as well as I would have liked was just really, you know, be very strategic about identifying the network of people and pulling them in. And we've, we've started to do it. We have a, a go-to-market council, which I think is spectacular and our handpicked people that we, we rely on to help us, you know, really grow our companies. And I think, I think, you know, doubling down on that, maybe in a few other areas is, is probably one of the things I would do. I also want to write a book and I want to, mm-hmm. <laughs> there's so many things. What? But, but I do think, I mean, there's a lot that was right. I mean, I think being in Silicon Valley is right. You know, having a small fund is right. Focusing where it, the highest, you know, I think impact area, which is, you know, late A, early B at that inflection point where you really get the best multiple for your money, right? It's the, but the problem is it's the hardest, I think, for to do. And I realize that now because if you go really early, it's kind of fun. Like you network, you write lots of checks, you have lots of friends and, and that all, it, all, it all works out really well. But, you know, there's not much to do because I've done that really early and I'm like, there's not much for me to do for a while until you build the product, right? And then, then I can come in and help. And then later stage, it's, you know, it's a different, thing you know you're you're looking at the financials and the sales forecast and the pipeline and but right at that kind of a b where you're starting to get traction it's a lot of work and it requires this operational skill set i think for people and it requires you to really like doing that work and so i think that's right you know for for what i would do again and i and i think i would be more i think i'd be more certain of it you know there's a lot of times when you question yourself and like maybe we should do this you know seed thing maybe you should do a growth strategy i i wouldn't even think about it anymore i would just be like this is what we're doing and if you want to do something else there are many other firms out there for you mm-hmm. <laughs> okay so one question is you mentioned about the network what does that mean like you mentioned like double down on the network is it like a yc network is it like your personal network is it like founders network how what what does the that network mean network of people who are just awesome at what they do and you know what i really love is that you know doubling down on women as leaders too like mm-hmm. there are so many awesome women out there and i think it's like a secret power a little bit and i probably would with some intentionality 
focus on bringing women that are just amazing women that are good at their individual, you know, skill set that they've built over years and just pull them in a little tighter. Okay, we have a one minute fire round. So number one question is, what's your favorite book? Favorite book. So I actually, I do a lot on health and just, you know, wellness. And mm-hmm. I know like people talk about Peter Tia and all that, but I'll tell you my favorite book ever in that whole sector. And I've got a whole wall of them is called The Walls Protocol. And if you just want to be healthier and feel better, just follow her diet. Okay. Uh, I will definitely check that out. Okay. So who um, made the biggest impact in your career? Uh, biggest impact in my career is, uh, in terms of, you know, the trajectory is um, a few people. One, my physics professor in high school that told me to you know stay the course in STEM, which I think is really important to get involved at grassroots efforts for women and minorities in engineering. But two is Renault at Lending Club. So when I came into venture and it was, you know, Q1 of 09, which I don't know if you remember what that looked like, but it was a shit show. And I had oh. wanted to do Lending Club and you know, no one was lending money at that time. But I was I I got a huge amount of conviction for it and had worked with him and had done some, probably the deepest diligence I'd ever done. I used to I was actually at Nextcard too, which was the first online credit card company, so I knew a lot about you know what he was up to. And you know Gary Little and I sat at the table with Renault and we presented him with the term sheet. And by the way, it was a down round, which I don't know if we've seen <laughs> you know many of those right now, but it was a down round. And I had just thought I was in venture for a year, I thought at the time, and I thought I would maybe be an observer and perhaps at some future date be a CMO for him. And uh, he looked at Gary and I, and he said, you know what, I will sign your term sheet, but only for Becca's by board member. And I had no idea it was coming. And I was like, oh, well, and I didn't even really know what that meant at that time, but it meant it, it sealed my fate in venture because then it turned out to be the biggest US tech IPO five years later. Right. Mm-hmm. And so and it made a big difference. I mean, somebody to say, I want you on my board. And to Gary Little's credit, I think most other men in venture, because by the way, there were very few women in venture at that point in time, like less than 3% of people on boards were women in venture capital at that point. He immediately said, absolutely. He's like, we we serve our entrepreneurs is what he told him. And he goes, if Rebecca is the board member that you want, then that's who you'll have. And then he not only, you know, Gary said that, and then he also asked if he could have an observer seat and he coached me on board meetings. And so, and he was pretty direct. So at the breaks of board meetings, he was like, that was a really bad idea to say that thing. Maybe next time you Mm -hmm. save it, (laughs) maybe Mm -hmm. you phrase it this way instead, right? (laughs) And so I got uh, some really great coaching that I think not very many people in venture are lucky enough to have, so... Amazing. Okay. So who I, I want to focus on this, but like, okay. So who would you invite to your dinner party? I think, I think there are two people. So Sam Bankman Freed, I like to just be like, what the fuck were you thinking? <laughs> I'd love to know. <laughs> and then the other one, I, I love to have a uh, dinner with Taylor Swift because I'm just, she's like an amazing woman business person. I mean, everything she touches turns to gold. Right. And yeah, I just for love sure. to understand more about how she sees the world and of business. So. Oh my God, your answer is so interesting. Everybody want to invite Elon Musk for like their <laughs> dinner. So Elon Musk is like literally the most popular <laughs> dinner guest on our show. The funny Elon story, but I'll... <laughs> anyway, sorry. I'm yeah, I'm sure like you probably already <laughs> had dinner with Elon yeah. Musk, so that's like not really on your list anymore. But where uh, can we find you outside of work? Where can you find me outside work? Many places. You can find me. I, I spend a ton of time outside. I love the trails. I love to be running on my horse. I love a huge water bug. So surfing, anything in the water pretty much. And then I spend a lot of time with my kiddos, you know, and a lot of time in the, I have, my son has a kind of a makeshift workshop in the garage. So I spend a lot of time hanging out out there and trying to figure out what the next uh, tool I have to buy at Home Depot might be. Amazing. Oh, well, thank you so much, Rebecca, for taking the time. I'm sorry that like we went over for went, went over your like late for your cake. You're from thing. University of Illinois. I mean, of course. Oh my God! Thank you. You're the best. <laughs> thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thanks, Grace. Thanks for tuning into Smart Venture Podcast. If you learned something from the episode or even just mildly tolerated me, please subscribe and leave a five-star rating. I promise I will keep bringing you more successful, insightful interviews and insider tips about startups. Remember, sharing is caring. So tell your friends to listen too, or enemies, I won't judge. Until next time, keep venturing smartly.